everybody welcome back to this week's episode of life in private staffing hope you're well um as i mentioned on our last episode we're having a bit of a shift now in our focus of these episodes and we want to start now talking to employers of private staff because i think that would be really useful as we go through this year where market's still fairly slow and there's still a lot of people looking for work um to get some employers on and um, whether it's the principal themselves or people that manage the employment on behalf of the principal to talk more on the recruitment side, to give those looking for work a bit of advice and a bit of support during these times. And we have a um, lovely guest, Rachel, back on, who we've had on before. Um, Rachel, you're our first returner. Oh, honoured. <laughs> <laughs> honoured. First returner. So we've had Rachel on before um, earlier in the year because um, we were talking to her about her story. She's got years and years and years of experience in senior management positions within the sector. Um, but getting her back on today, but instead of talking about her and her story, focusing much more on about her uh, on her experience when it comes to recruiting um, and talking more as an employer rather than an employee. So a um, few things we want to cover today and I hope we all find it useful. Um, so welcome back to the show, Rachel. Rachel, how are you? Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Good. Having a lovely summer so far? Um, let's hope it stays like this. We've had a yeah. few monsoons in Bournemouth recently, mm. but let's hope it brightens up and stays like this. We all need a bit of sun, don't we? We certainly do. The weather forecast I uh, on my app, next couple of weeks, it's amazing. So we've got at least oh. two weeks of summer. All right, we'll all come around yours then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. England's so crap, isn't it? We have like a couple oh. of days and then a monsoon. Um, <laughs> So let's get straight into it. So how long have you, remind us all how long you've been working in the private sector for? So I've been in this industry, um, I keep saying 28 years, but obviously time's moved. It's naturally, <laughs> it's coming up to about 30 years. So wow. I, I was obviously a child when I started. So yeah, about 30 years now I've been in this industry and I started as a house manager and I've been estate manager, chief of staff, property manager. I've done a bit of everything. Um, in the management level and that's involved seeing a lot of CVs, interviewing a lot of staff, recruiting a lot of staff and unfortunately firing a few too. <laughs> yeah, so you you probably have seen it all. Um, I've seen it all in regards to CVs, I've seen the best and the worst of CVs. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that shortly because there are certain <laughs> ways, there are certain things to avoid, certain things to try and sort of include. <laughs> Um, so would you say you probably recruited what probably hundreds in your time yeah. over the yeah, years? I've lost track. Yeah. Yeah. And run us through some some of the roles you that you've been responsible for recruiting for. Is it mainly sort of internal stuff? Um, it's been everything, I would say. I've okay. recruited chauffeurs, gardeners, pool people, um, nutritionists, physical trainers, personal trainers, and then I've recruited nannies, housekeepers, laundry maids, valets, butlers, house mm. managers security staff I've recruited, uh, farming staff, animal care. Um, one of my jobs was setting up an ostrich farm for a client. Mm. I recruited ostrich breeders, you know, mm. for animal staff. I've recruited sort of specialist security people for different projects. Um, a bit of everything, I would say, across the board and in different languages and different countries where wow. it's very different interviewing, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, that's one thing we definitely need to include in these podcasts talking with uh, employers is some of the unique roles. So I remember this conversation we had before, the ostrich, yeah. Uh, yeah, ostrich farm. And, and yeah, we've had some... conversations you can have about ostrich breeding. It gets really in-depth. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Like, we've had some mad stuff. The, the weird roles that we have in are normally from um, UAE. Yeah. It's normally over there that we get the sort of There's the more roles stuff. now for people to look after dogs and, and be the specialist dog nanny and things like this. I mean, we never saw this 20, 30 years ago, but yeah. obviously it's got slightly crazier and, and more bizarre things are coming up these days, aren't they? But it's yeah, fun. But the variety, doesn't it? <laughs> I was going to say, I love it. Like, I yeah, love it. I love, it. Um, I love the usual ones. Yeah, exactly. Even though you're thinking, where the hell am I going to get a zookeeper for the zoo in a house? The dates that these unusual roles pull in are fascinating. Yeah, crazy. Um, so as an employer then, what is it you would say that you're looking for when you're thinking, regardless of the role, what's, what is it you're sort of like maybe looking for in somebody? To start off with, I'm looking for a crystal clear CV so that yeah. I can look at it and get a picture of that candidate. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be fancy. The more easy to read and, and simple, sometimes the better. I want to know what that person is capable of. Mm. Um, and it, quite often you get a very, very nice, eloquent CV 
But after you've read it, and even if you've read it all the way through completely, you still have no idea of what that person actually does or is capable of. Mm. So list things, bullet point things. Bullet points are great. I'm a big fan of bullet points. Bullet yeah. point your skills. Not yeah. what you do every day, starting off with I serve the breakfast. I, you know, just put the bullet points. You can serve at the table. You can, yeah. you know, prepare light snacks, whatever the things are. Yeah. Yeah, we find that. I sometimes say to people, don't rewrite your job description on your CV. I know what a butler does. I don't need to know what you do as a butler. I need to, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, it's yeah. It's about so- knowing what makes that person special. Why should I choose you? If your CV can tell me that, I think you're onto a winner. Yeah. Do What's your preferred length of a CV? Two pages. I never Same. read on two pages. Yeah, I agree. Um, we don't need to. If I appreciate that people have done a lot in their time. Yeah. So I would say elaborate on your last five years. Yeah. And then as the years go back, you don't need to elaborate at all. And if we're talking 10 plus years, all you need, you need to do is put a job title and the dates. Um, and then you can stop at 15 years like yeah yeah exactly and, and if, if you think there's a lot to cover add a cover letter mm. if there's stuff that you think I really want that in my CV but there's no room add a good cover letter yeah um, I've seen some CVs I've had CVs that have been 16 pages long um, and I think it's a mistake that chefs and nannies tend to get into more often than not because they tend to work for a shorter period with a family they don't tend to stay 10 years. A chef might stay a year. A nanny, mm. a maternity nanny might only be there three months, six months. Mm. And because they want to list you all the places they've worked, their CV becomes a book. Um, yeah. It's not necessary. You can lump some of these jobs together. There's, there's ways of, of putting it so that it's not a 16 page CV because to be honest, nobody's going to read that. Yeah. You just sit there with the pages and go, well, I've read the first two. I'm not going any deeper in this. It's too hard work it gets tossed and you move on to the next one. Yeah, because I think if you've got a pile of CVs there, we have this well, you've got a big pile of CVs, you're going to glance at page one before you decide whether to read, C- read the CV or not. And if yeah. you glance, I get some, and they are so stressful to look at yeah. because there's so much on there. Some people yeah. have these weird grids things. And yeah. I uh, and so and we don't give it much more thought than that because unfortunately you're not the only CV that's on the desk. Exactly. You know, there's lots I mean, of other CVs. Imagine, you, you deal with hundreds of CVs. When I mm. advertise a role or when I'd be looking for somebody, I would get mm, 30, 40 CVs. So mm. I would try and read them all. But mm. there's some... Um, Colours. Colours are not good in a CV. We mm. don't need things highlighted in different colours. We don't need curly fonts. Mm. And this might sound really basic, but it's amazing the CVs out there. If you worked at a hotel, we don't need their logo and the flag mm. of that country on your CV in bright colours. It's mm. just distracting. You want me to see the words that tell me what you can do. That should yeah. be the most important point. And I always say to people, I, I have this tip that I've been using for years, which is hold up the pages of your CV at arm's length, lightly squint your eyes and see mm. what stands out. Because that's mm. probably going to be the thing that a recruiter looks at when they've got three seconds to glance at it. If that's not what you want them to see first, change your CV. Yeah, 100%. What's your view on photos on a CV? As in like a headshot? I love a photo. I love Agreed. a photo. A photo tells me probably more than some of the CV wording. Mm. I like a photo. I like a, a casual photo, not a formal. I like something that shows you. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Some people are really weird about adding photos. And obviously, in any other sector, it's um, completely frowned upon. Yeah, and exactly. completely inappropriate. Exactly. I have this argument sector. on LinkedIn so often where people say, no, no, yeah. photo shouldn't be on there. Sorry, for us, it's an absolute must. Yeah, no, we, it, we need world. to be well, yeah, need to be well presented. Yeah. You can tell if, I feel like I can tell if, how friendly someone is from a photo, I reckon. I read a lot into a photo. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably wrong, but I do read a lot into a photo. And I will quite often judge whether I interview on the mm. photo. Yeah. And just a few bits of the CV. And that's not me saying I'm looking for good looking people. I'm no. looking for someone that looks like they're smiley, relaxed, confident. Mm. You know, it's going to take instruction. It's going to be flexible. Um, it sounds bizarre, but yeah, I, I read a lot into a photo. It also says a lot about the candidate as to the type of photo they choose. I have exactly. honestly had photos where you can see that it's a head, they've cropped the head out, but I can see the fag end. 
<laughs> that they've, they've cropped, the, cropped the hand up. I can see the fag end. I've had chauffeur CVs when I used to do ski recruitment for the ski industry. Chauffeur CVs with a pint in the hand. Yeah, um, I've seen those. They're quite shocking. I've had topless shocking. ones, males, males going for security roles, and the photo, the headshot is a topless one. We don't need to see that. You're not going to walk around the estate like that. Put some clothes on. <laughs> yeah, we know you're buff. It's fine. You're a security <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, we're good <pretty> fit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, nicely laid out, clear CV. Yeah. I also really don't like it where they put their oldest job first. I want your newest oh, job yeah. first. Yeah, I want to know what you're doing now. What yeah. you did 20, 30 years ago is really not of that much importance. Your most recent job first. Yeah. And I like dates. Yeah. And I like the dates to tie up. If your dates don't tie up and there's a gap, put something on there that tells me why there's a gap because otherwise I yeah. get suspicious. Agreed. If you don't tell me, I suspect the worst. Yeah, agreed. Explain your gaps. Even if it took two months off of job hunting, it's fine. Yeah, it's and the other thing I the other thing I quite like is when people put um just one line under each job, reason for leaving. Yeah. And that's yeah. quite nice. Reason for leaving. Yeah. And even if see that much now. You you don't see no. that on CVs now. It used to be the norm. I mean, when I was young, you used to do that. You I left here because I moved to a better job. Um, mm. I got fired, I didn't like my boss, my boss, you know, a whole yeah. Place of reasons but you don't tend to see that very much anymore no which which therefore makes it stand out when you do yeah and i think great clarity is great if, if you say these things it stops people suspecting anything else um, yeah so be up front put the facts out there yeah fair and um, when you have employed in the past what's been your go-to do you um do you go to a recruiter and get cvs through them in addition to doing your own advertising or would you always prioritize your own advertising I've done both depending on the position and depending on the country. Um, yeah. Recruiters in some countries are better than others, I have to say. In England, I would always go to a recruiter. Mm. Um, I've got good relationships with recruiters in London. There's there's quite a few good recruiters. There's mm. some that I don't use and there's, there's some that I do. Um, mm. And I would say the recruiters have a good knowledge of the pool of candidates in the UK. Um, yeah. Quite often they will say, I know the person for you. Yeah. Say I've got three or four that would fit this role. Um, yeah. I think a recruiter saves you a lot of time when it's a good recruiter, and so I suppose yeah. it's knowing the good recruiters from the bad ones, and having that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and I like to have a relationship with recruiters and know them, and that way I know who I can go to for specific roles because yeah. some recruiters are more specialist. There's obviously yeah. agencies that are more nanny focused. Um, Having said that, I like recruiters that do a bit of everything. So I think they have more of their finger on the button. You know, they, mm. they have that feeling of what's going on in the industry better. So yeah, and the, the reason I ask that is I, I know that some candidates um, avoid recruiters because they think some of the good employers don't use recruiters and all the rest. So the reason I ask that is yeah, nice for people dark. listening to be like have relationships with recruiters as well as keeping your eye out for yeah. you know direct direct adverts because yeah. don't think that don't think that some of the top jobs avoid recruiters they don't avoid recruiters you know so um i think there's more headhunters that have appeared uh, maybe mm. that's been a, a covid related thing but there's definitely more headhunters out there and people working on their own mm. um, and that that can be good and bad that i've met some mm. great ones um my experience in the uk has been that the people that advertise on places like gumtree for staff are the families you probably want to avoid Mm. Uh, there's a reason why those families don't use recruiters they're probably blacklisted and there's yeah. a reason why you see those same ads on gumtree again and again and again so mm. if you are a housekeeper or a nanny in particular looking at those ads be very very careful would be my advice why aren't you registered with recruiters mm. you know if you have a bad experience with a recruiter don't tarnish all recruiters with the same yeah. there's some great recruiters out there you've got to register with a lot of them and speak mm. with them and be in touch with them and build a relationship and see are these the sorts of people that I want to work with that are going to help me there's lots yeah. of this out there about good recruiters yeah and there's a two-way street I totally appreciate if you have a bad experience with a recruiter you think they're all crap but you know if a recruiter has a bad experience with a housekeeper we can't sit here and exactly. think all housekeepers are all crap and then treat you exactly. all the same you know so yeah. um but in terms of saving time 100 I as a recruitment agency owner I use recruitment agencies when I'm recruiting staff for me. Exactly. Which is mental. Exactly. Because if I wanted, if I wanted a nanny or a housekeeper, fine, I can do that myself. But if I want a recruitment consultant, exactly. nobody, nobody looking at my website is looking to sit in an office and do recruitment. They're all looking for yeah. private, looking for private household work. Mm. So I'm, I'm aware of that. So I will go to a 
recruitment agency that are specialists in recruiting recruitment consultants yeah. because it saves me time and yeah build a relationship find someone you like and then um, I just want <clears throat> I just want a Friday afternoon to interview three people and pick one yeah, that's exactly it I want to phone the agency and say this is what we're looking for this is the job spec I understand yeah. the specs quite well um, I can give them a good job spec I can give them a salary guide and say Oh, or we talk about salaries and I say, what's the current salary range? What do you advise? Things change, things move mm-hmm. on, especially for the role I haven't recruited for for a while. Um, and then I know that I don't have to do anything. And within a couple of days, I'm getting CVs. Yeah. Um, so it means that I can carry on with my job. I'm, I'm, not, the rec- I'm not a recruiter, professional recruiter. Mm. I'm somebody that knows what we need for this particular household, you know? Yeah. So I, I just want to get CVs and get on with it and get that person in the position as soon as possible. And get on with life exactly in your That's like fine. yeah exactly like you as a house manager have a house to run mm. you have no time to put to recruitment a recruitment consultant their entire their only job is to recruit exactly um exactly. also the other, the other way i see it is if if you were to put a job advert up on a website um you, all you're gonna see is who happened to see that job on that website yeah. on that month it's not actually an indicator of who is available in the market yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? You could there could be an amazing, amazing, amazing candidate that didn't happen to see that job advert on that day. Um, plus, with, plus well, I'm not even sure where you'd advertise. Um, you know, are you going to advertise on Facebook? What mm. are you going to get from that? Are you going to advertise mm. on Gumtree? And I always think the people that are looking for the jobs on there, why aren't they registered with recruiters? Mm. Um, and for the same people that families advertise on there, why aren't you using recruiters? And it makes mm. me want to avoid that whole market and just go. Let's get some professional. Let's get someone mm. that the recruiter has met, checked their mm. ID, and we know a bit about their background. Let's start on that kind of footing, and and you can only go forwards from there. And there's that quote, isn't it, where someone said, um, "I don't know, it's so expensive uh, to use an agency." It's like, yeah, but if you think it's expensive, mm. like it's, it's so much more expensive to get it wrong because I'm, I'm not cheap, and if you're going to take three months of my time for me mm. to find somebody myself what's that cost mm, yeah what, what have I not been able to do while I've been focused yeah. on that recruiting um, yeah expensive people say things are expensive people will say a Chanel handbag's expensive mm. for other people it's quite reasonable it yeah. is something that is a is a movable field and sometimes an expensive thing that saves you a lot of time and gets you the right person is actually worthwhile yeah, exactly. It's all about value rather than cost. Yeah, right, exactly. Do you get value for money from it? If you get the right candidate, you get great value for money. You'll be yeah. happy with what you've done. If you haven't got the right candidate, it probably does feel very expensive. But that's down to your recruiting process, isn't it? You've got the yeah. Wrong um, anyway, I didn't really mean to go down this uh, rabbit hole talking about <laughs> recruiters. I just did. I always talk about recruitment. Um, so when you're, so obviously you've got your CVs, you're recruiting. You've, you've, you, we now know what you like to see in a CV and what you don't like to see in a CV. You're, you've selected people to interview. Yeah. Um, when candidates come for interview, where do you feel people fall down frequently in the interview? Where, why do people not pass, what get, get a yes from you? So I'm just going to um, put the light, light back on. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I, I really dislike people that have a cigarette instantly before they come for the interview. And they've obviously finished their cigarette on the pavement, come into our house or estate for an interview, and they reek of cigarette smoke. Mm. I hate that. It's mm. a real turn off. Um, I don't like those that turn up chewing gum. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like those whose only question is about holidays and bank holidays and hours and what time do we finish. These are all questions that you should ask, but maybe not the first questions and maybe not in the process of the interview before we've got to the question part. Um, it doesn't give the right impression. And it always, even in these days, still amazes me when that's people's priority and focus. Mm. have you not done interviews before do you not know that this is about selling yourself and you're not really selling yourself the thing is it sounds really obvious but you'd be surprised like exactly. it happens all the time yeah 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 lots of people I've got a holiday booked I've got a wedding booked and I need to go to my best friend's birthdays brother's dog's event and I'm like well we haven't even given you the job yet but you're already trying to work out how much time you can get off yeah this is an industry where flexibility is probably one of the top requisites yeah um i might say to you on a friday the boss has just turned up plans have changed who can stay and do another couple of hours 
you expect flexibility. We're yeah. not paid the same as hospitality. We get a better mm. pay than similar jobs in hospitality. There's a reason for that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How do you like someone to dress when they come and see you? Um, I'm quite open on this. Um, smart, clean, smart. You don't have to be suited and booted. Your job is probably not a suited and booted job. Mm. Um, I mean, these days, there's not many formal security guys wear suits sometimes. Um, butlers maybe are suited. Um, I'm not a, a type of manager that wears a suit. Mm. I'm not that sort of person. So I don't expect people to be dressed like, you know, they're going for an interview at the bank. But you have got to be clean, mm. be presentable. Your clothes have got to be clean and tidy. Um, I would say go easy on the perfume and the aftershave. We don't need to smell you before you get in the room. You don't need loads of makeup. You don't need loads of clanking jewellery. Mm. Go for less. Less is, less is more. Yeah. yeah. And like you say, just clean, well-groomed, washed, trimmed, yeah. beard, yeah. The usual. Things they kind of think are obvious, but it seems they're not. <laughs> yeah, they're not. And again, well, poor chefs. I find sometimes it's the chefs that are probably more unsure as to how to dress mm. because they are hidden a lot, but you still need to be incredibly clean and tidy yeah. and groomed. Yeah. Chefs don't need to turn up for an interview in their chef's outfits. No, and no. And they're also probably not the sort of people that want to wear a suit. But, you know, just rock up in a clean pair of trousers and a clean shirt and be, mm. and be clean and fresh and groomed. Bring mm. photos of your food. Because yeah. with them, it's the food that sells them. So bring photos of your food. Bring as many photos of your food as you want. Just showing me three dishes doesn't really tell me you. Mm. Do you like people to have a notepad and pen during an interview, make it even if they don't write, it looks like they're taking it seriously? Um, it depends on the role. I've, I've had some turn up with a notepad and pen and then they look embarrassed because they haven't written anything down. Mm. It's fine. It's not <clears throat> you need it. I would say it's not essential. Mm. I like the people that get the notebook out and they've got questions written down because they're yeah. thinking about the role and they've got questions. And quite often they'll say, well, I had some questions. We've covered some of them in our conversation, but could I still mm. ask you? Yeah, that's, great. that's yeah. great. I like questions. I was just going to say, is there such thing as too many questions? Uh, I suppose so. Um, mm. You know, interviews have to end. We have other people to interview. Um, but you should have valid questions about the role and how you're going to fit into the role and about other things that, that make a difference on that role. You yeah. Know, you should have questions and they, they should be questions that show me that you've thought about the job and you've considered how you would fit in. Yeah. We've had feedback before from clients who have said, oh, they asked loads of questions and it put me off because it makes me feel like they, I don't know, are a bit unsure because they're asking too many questions. It's like, people are allowed, that's their opportunity to yeah, ask questions. I think, I think it's different. If you're the principal interviewing, it probably hasn't occurred to you that this candidate is also interviewing you. Mm. Uh, and so when they start asking the principal questions, I think for some people, it can get their backs up a little bit. As mm. a, a house or an estate manager or the chief of staff, you're kind of that go-between. Yeah, know? I'm not going to pay your salary. You're not going to work for me as such but under me. So I don't mind the questions because I'm not taking it personally. And I fully understand that you want to find out if you would fit here as much as I want to know if I think you would fit here. Yeah. So I don't get that personal, you know, thing from it. And I, I think it's good when you ask questions. Just Agreed. Good questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep them, keep them not stupid. Um, and yeah. does it, um, do you mind if people want to know a bit more about the last person who was in the role and how well they did and how long they thought and why they left? Not at all. I think it's totally normal. Um, I quite often have people say, why is this role available? Is this a yeah. new role or am I replacing somebody? Mm. And they quite often, if they're replacing somebody, they quite often want to know how long the last person was there for. People are looking for longevity in roles. Things are very uncertain, especially now more than ever. And I think people want to know that if they make this change and come to you and work for you, that, that role's going to be secure yeah um, so yeah um but i've also known i've gone for interviews myself where i've asked about the previous person and i've been lied to and said the previous person was there for years mm -hmm. and then you find out actually no there was you know six people in this role in the last 12 months nobody stayed so it's very difficult and i i answer people honestly if the last person was fired or if they left very quickly i tell them that and i also mm -hmm. tell them why 
And sometimes it reflects well on the household and other times maybe it doesn't. But I'm going to be upfront with you and say, that's why this role is available. But moving forward, maybe we would change things because it didn't work out. And, it, and it's a question of you and me working together, the candidate and I working together and making this role fit and be successful. I don't want disruption in the house any more than you want to take a role and find after a month that it's not for you. Yeah. And it's not going to reflect well in the house at all to say, oh, no, the role's amazing. Someone's been here for 10 years. And then you get there and then you find out. It makes you look even worse as a household. Yeah, we're a, we're a relatively small industry. People know yeah. people. And you can't hide the bad families where there's a revolving door of staff. You can't hide that. Word gets out. So it's best to say this is quite a um, difficult household. But I mm. feel you can either step up to it and manage it or maybe that's not for you. Um, and there's people that will be happy to know that and take the job. And there's other people that will be happy to know that and think it's not for me. Mm. I don't want you coming if it's not for you, because it just makes further disruption for me and more work. Yeah, agreed. Um, what, what can someone do then? So what, what, um, what, how do I write this? What can someone do to really impress you? So sort of like, what could happen to you? Like that, that's, oh. Yeah. Bring chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> bribe um, me no don't do not bribe your interviewer unless <laughs> it's me um gosh I don't know I have to say it's a while since I've been really impressed um mm. I think maybe I'm getting a bit jaundiced with some of it I don't know um somebody that is as good in person as they were on paper mm. quite often you get a candidate and they're better on paper or they're better in the interview Somebody who interviews as well as they read on paper and you think both things are really good, that's impressive. Yeah, you can I like it. Help in an interview when they've had somebody else write their CV. That's um, another topic, isn't it? Do you write your own CV? Of course you bloody yeah, do. Because, you know, when somebody else writes your CV, although it's probably 100% truthful, they've written it in a style of language that maybe isn't yours. Um, quite often some foreign candidates will get somebody else to write the CV because they think the English is better, but it doesn't correlate to them properly and you don't get their personality on the paper. And then they turn up and you get their personality and it's either an instant yes or it's an instant no. Mm. Um, so, you know, write your CV yourself as much as you can. Get someone to check it over by all means. Write your CV yourself and make sure your personality is sold on your CV and in your interview. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I also think it's quite, I quite like it when, unless it's the principal interviewing you, if it's, if you can get the name of your interviewer mm. in advance, um, do some research. Yeah. Try to find them on LinkedIn. If, like, I quite like it if I get a message day before saying that I'd connect, I'm looking forward to an interview with you tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like, oh, okay, they're preparing. Yeah. Yeah, I always stalk people. If I know who yeah. I'm going to interview for, I stalk them. I find them on Instagram and LinkedIn mm -hmm. and Facebook and I look at yeah. what they're like and who their families. I try and get a picture of them, especially if it's a principal. You know, yeah. you can find out as much as possible. I think somebody that comes to an interview that is organized, their CV stacks up, everything relates properly, the dates all follow through, they can talk about their jobs. Uh, without having to really really think about that job you know they can tell you when you ask them questions they can tell you about that job mm. um, quite openly that's impressive these days yeah do you like a nice little follow-up next day it was lovely to have met with you yesterday no um you're not bothered no. about that and I'm, and I'm sure there's lots of people out there that disagree with that but no I I <laughs> this is going to sound terrible I don't have time for that mm -hmm. I want my recruiter to deal with that I want the recruiter yeah. to deal with that I want to be able to go back to the recruiter and say, this one was great. This one's a possible. This one was a definite no. Can we please get these ones back for a second? Interview? I want to get to the point of having that person working for us and in the house. Mm -hmm. So I want them to follow up with the agent and say, was there feedback from my interview? Mm -hmm. um, because it's easier to have that agent as the go-between. Yeah. And that's what you're there for. That's your job, you know. So that's what I want to use you for as the, the go-between. The feedback is um, often more open and honest as well when there's a middleman. Yes. yes. When you, if you have a candidate that comes that's brilliant, it's very easy to give them positive feedback. But when you have candidates come for the jobs that they're just not suited for or it's just not a good fit, it's very difficult to be honest with them. But to give them no feedback is, is not constructive to them either. So I mm. would rather talk to the recruiter and say, look, we felt X, Y, Z. 
And the recruiter more often than not has got a pretty good idea of, of maybe how you feel about it. Mm. Um, and they can go back to the candidate and say, well, they just didn't feel that this was quite right, or maybe you need to work on that. It, it's a lot more gentler than me saying to a candidate, well, you're totally wrong for us because of this. Mm. You know, we, we don't yeah. need to touch people's dreams. We need to guide them to the right direction. Yeah. Um, what's your view on the ideal number of interview stages? Because obviously there's oh. definitely, a, there's definitely a too many stages in this. I'm, yeah, there's I'm been a lot of talk about this online lately, hasn't there? Because mm. some interviews are going to sort of level five and six for interviews. It's way too much. Um, I don't care if, if you're the gardener or you're the pot washer in the kitchen or whether you're the estate manager. Two interviews is fab. Yeah. You need one interview as a random interview of, you know, all the candidates. And then we need to narrow it down for a second interview. Yeah. Um, if I was recruiting, I've had instances where the principal is happy for me to recruit. And then they start on their first day and I introduce them to the principal. And I've had others where they've wanted to meet them. And so maybe they've come in for the last couple of minutes of that second interview, just mm. to really confirm that, yes, they're happy with my pick. Uh, sometimes the principal's out the country and we have to arrange a third interview for him to meet them. Tends to only happen with maybe higher up roles, maybe more of the management roles mm. or nannies. Nannies are a very personal thing because obviously you're looking after my children. So yeah. that's a personal thing. Very often the, the parents want to meet the nanny before they hire. But other than that, two interviews should be fine. Yeah, I agree because it, everyone just loses momentum. Everyone loses sort of interest. It all just yeah. ends up a bit, bit flat and a bit, well, you're I over it before it's even begun. I like to get CVs. I narrow my CVs down to about 10 I would interview maybe four or five uh, and I would hope to get two maybe three back for a second interview and make a decision yeah within two weeks bitch bash bosh it'd be yeah. nice to always work like that sometimes when you're interviewing candidates that are working elsewhere it's hard to get them in on the days that you want for interviews yeah um, you know so that can be a, a time delay but you want to get this process over as soon as possible it shouldn't want you nobody should want it to drag out any longer than it absolutely has to yeah and the minute, the minute it does drag out, and as a job seeker, you probably experience it as well. When it's sort of like, when it does drag out, then it's e really easy for the principal to be like, oh, let's just and hold, I'm busy now, let's pick it up. And, yeah. and then, and then it, you end up not really, if it doesn't happen fairly quickly, it generally does, yeah. never happens. It doesn't happen, or the wrong person gets hired. Yeah. If you say, this is my top pick, I want to hire that person, she was amazing. And you go to the agent and they say, oh, she's just accepted an offer elsewhere damn yeah okay we'll take the second one but she was the second best choice for a reason yeah and sometimes that can be the wrong decision yeah so, it's know, tricky though, isn't it out. choose choose people interview them pick the best candidate and hire them before somebody else does yeah exactly like don't and one thing i'd always sort of say to employers is like don't think that you're sort of above the candidates in any sort of way because exactly. you know, off, the employer often needs the candidate more than the candidate needs the employer yeah. Because say, for example, the employer finds the most perfect housekeeper, the housekeeper could literally get snapped up anywhere. Yeah. But like the employer wants them. So like, don't be too blasé about your offers and, you know, undercutting the salary and all the rest. Yeah. If you want yeah. somebody, show them that you want them, you know, it'll start really where, well. That's where it's an advantage to have somebody like me that's helping the principal with their recruiting, because I can say to them, quite honestly, she's not going to come for that sort of money. Mm. You know, she can get that out on the market now she can get this much money mm. why are we trying to undercut the last one was paid this much you know mm. and I can have those quite open and frank conversations with them um, yeah. sometimes it's harder for a recruiter to do as, as the agent um, you know and, and sometimes these people have no idea of what is the current market value for that job it mm. may have been a long time since they've recruited that particular role uh, things have changed I mean, yeah. like right, now, right now, I think that housekeepers and chefs are in hot demand. Mm. Um, the couples role, I see loads of couples roles. I don't know any couples anymore. Mm. So, that's, you know, things have changed. And what maybe was quite a, an affordable position five years ago, nowadays is in hot demand. So you mm. have got to have your finger on the button a little bit and know people's worth and, and what the current prices and market values are. One thing I hate is when a client advertises a role at a certain salary, say, for example, house manager role, 80 grand, and they find the perfect person, they ask the perfect person, what was your last salary? I think that's a totally irrelevant question. Yeah. What is that got to do with anything? I could have been yeah. a lawyer before. I don't like it's nothing. And then the person says I was on 65. And then the client's like, right, we're going to offer you 70. 
Yeah. And the recruiters are old in a minute. It was meant to be 80. Yeah. And then the candidate is pissed off with the recruiter because it looks like the recruiter got it all, got it all wrong yeah. or communicated yeah. it wrong. And it's not, I don't think that, I just don't think an employer should ask a candidate what your last salary was because I think it's completely irrelevant. I don't think relevant. it's relevant. I don't nah. think it's relevant. If your last salary, if you're going for a job that's 80, if your yeah. last salary was 120 or your last salary was 50, what should it matter? Yeah. If you've got to the stage of the interviews where they want to put some an offer forward or they want to talk about salary, it's obviously because you like that person and you feel they're capable of doing the role. And, and they could have come from another country where the salaries were totally different. Yeah. You know, it really shouldn't matter. And principals who try to cut down salaries just because they think they can, they're the sort of principals that we should avoid working for. 100%. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, out there and make it clear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get what you pay for, and if you scream, we're, you... we're not we're not something that gets out of date, and we have to be marked down. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you have to pay to get experience and expertise. Uh, things are only expensive when they go wrong. Yeah, agreed. And if you're going to be trying to pay as little as possible, the candidate's going to give you as little as possible, yeah. as little as they yeah. get away with. If you if you are generous, and if the candidate feels very well looked after they will go above and beyond for you it's give and take it's just so short-sighted to think anyway otherwise yeah i think um, you can make the mistake of thinking that a person's expensive i know that when i start with a new family i can save them a huge amount of money in the first 12 months mm. by correcting things that are wrong realigning the staffing improving things you know mm. you're probably going to save some money with the right mm. stuff the wrong staff are going to cost you money for sure. Yeah, but that doesn't exactly. mean that a person's salary makes them cheap or expensive. It, it means you've either got the right person or the wrong person. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, look, on that note, like, I'm <laughs> desperately trying to make these podcasts short on a, on a bi-weekly basis. Even I get bored listening to these podcasts sometimes when they're too long. But um, I just wanted a real sort of, you know, good little insight into things from the employer point of view. So I think some of the stuff we talked about today, I think people will find useful and even people who do recruitment uh, or manage the recruitment on behalf of the employer might find some of this stuff useful as well. So um, thank you very much for coming on and for um, spending a bit more time with me. Um, just before we go, do you want to talk a little bit about the event that you've got, got upcoming? Right. So I am planning an event that I'm hoping to hold in London before Christmas. Um, I'm hoping October time. Um, an event for networking for people in the private staffing industry. It's going to be open to everybody and anybody. And it's a way for people that have met each other on LinkedIn through lockdown to actually meet people face to face. And I'm hoping that we will have people there who are estate managers, butlers, housekeepers, gardeners, chauffeurs. Uh, we have people in the security industry. We have recruiters. We'll have people who supply services and products to ultra high net worth industry. I know there's a couple of guys from jet charters, people that do insurance, different things. Let's get together. Let's have a few drinks. Let's meet each other face to face. Let's pass forward CVs, business cards, flyers. And so we can all walk away and say, I've met these people for real. I can do business with them. I can work for them. I want to be connected with them. Um, and just, you know, put some some real personalities to the faces and get to catch up with the people that maybe you've heard of or seen on LinkedIn or, or through different networks. Let's get together. I think it's a brilliant idea. And this industry, like we're all people, people, you know, uh, in this industry. And during lockdown, we've all just been, well, it, it, we're all just stuck in our own little worlds. But I do actually think online, we've all massively come together online. And exactly. I've made some I've made some lovely connections with people online. So from my point of view, I'd love to come and meet everybody, you, everybody face to face, you know. So um, these great idea. Few drinks and a catch up, you know, with, with people that we've got to know. Uh, we're just struggling a little bit at the minute to find the right venue. If anybody's got ideas about a venue, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, fabulous. Um, and we'll keep information on that event, you know, we'll keep bringing that forward and I'll make sure that I post stuff. It'll be a very sort of small token ticket prices to come. Yeah. And um, it's going to be cheap yeah. and fearful because we want people to come and, and get yeah. to meet everybody. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. So fabulous. So thank you very much Thanks, for your time today, Rachel. Um, and okay. thank you to everybody for listening once again. As always, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find my agency at Silver Swan Recruitment. You can connect with Rachel directly on LinkedIn. We'll tag her. 
and we will see you all next oh in two weeks i keep saying next week we'll see you all in two weeks thanks everybody bye